So Unreasonable Rocket, yeah. how did that get started? Well, the name or the how did it get started or, well, we'll do, we'll do both. Uh, how did Unreasonable Rocket get started? Um, I was wandering through uh, a section of Solana Beach. Uh, I don't even know why I was down there and I came across a rocket being built. And it turned out that it was the San Diego State student rocket being built in Flowmetrics, basically shop. And I wandered in and talked to him, and it looked kind of cool. It was about a 20-foot, 10-inch diameter liquid rocket. And it's like, wow, do you guys need any electronics? I and mean, that's what I do for a living. And so, yeah, we'd love some electronics help. We're a bunch of mechies. So I built the telemetry system and a video downlink and went out into the desert when they flew it. And it was, like, really cool. And I went to a couple more. And then I started volunteering at the site in the desert. And then I started reading the Armadillo Aerospace blog. And, um, yeah, <laughs> that was the path. Uh, I got started, you know, I thought, oh, this doesn't look too hard. I'll build my own liquid rocket. So I built a couple liquid rockets, and I thought, oh, I'll compete at the Lunar Lander Challenge. And my son and I built, you know, two flying vehicles to fly in the Lunar Lander Challenge. And uh, about... My son has gotten married and moved off to Seattle, so he's not around, so it's pretty much me in the garage, and I'm in the process of trying to figure out what that really looks like. Um, part of me would like to turn it into a full-time business, and I've done a lot of work in that realm, but it's, it's right on the edge. You know, It's sort of like I have a very, I have a very profitable sort of full-time business right now, do I give that up to go play with rockets in something that could be mar very marginal? It's what I'd like to do. At the same time, I you know, don't really want to live on a, under a bridge and eat dog food, so I'm not sure what the, what the right path there is. I mean, that's how Unreasonable Rocket got started. How it got its name was a George Bernard Shaw quote. Um, Reasonable men adapt themselves to the world unreasonable men adapt the world to themselves therefore all progress is due to unreasonable men so we're unreasonable rocket so. now um you, there have been several different types of designs that that you have done i mean for for the north of grumman uh, uh x prize challenge you had a vertical takeoff vertical landing and then i kind of see you following the same path as armadillo now you're having uh, more well the, i mean the reality is okay the end goal is something orbital. And something orbital, you don't have to recover it. It doesn't have to land back on the ground. None of that. And any of the stuff that does that is excess weight you can't have. You just can't have it. I mean, you know, an orbital vehicle has to be so light you can't imagine. I mean, uh, how do I explain this? Uh, the explanation I give is, um, you ever play tetherball? You know, you whack the ball around the pole. Well, if instead of whacking it sideways, you just push it out from the pole, it goes out and it comes back. It doesn't take much energy to make it go out and come back. That's getting to space, is out and back. That's what Spaceship One did. That's what Virgin Galactic's going to do. That's what the X-Core Lynx is going to do. They're going to get to space by going out and coming back. That's not getting to orbit. Getting to orbit, you, have to, you don't just have to go up, you have to go around fast enough that you, circ you basically continuously fall around the Earth and keep missing it. Sort of like the tether ball, you gotta whack it really hard. It takes a lot more energy to go into orbit than just to get to the von Karman line and say you're in space. I see the space, <laughs> using the other definition of space, the suborbital space for experiments and tourism and things like that, well populated. Got Armadillo and Mastin and Xcore and Virgin Galactic and you know several other schemes and ideas. And while I could probably just do that task now, come very close to it, maybe I wouldn't choose to be as big as some of the other vehicles, but I could do it now. The market there to me looks entirely artificial. It looks like the market is induced by the NASA cruiser program as an artificial market, and I don't see from a business standpoint that being a long-term market. I, d I personally don't believe in Virgin Galactic's business plan because I think paying $200,000 for a four-minute weightless experience, while it's kind of cool, if you had the money, have the money, you know, it's good bragging rights, I really question how many repeat visitors they will get. 
and it won't take too long to fly everybody who has two hundred thousand dollars, and then everybody who has a hundred thousand dollars, and then everybody who has fifty, and then maybe it'll putter along at a background level between somewhere between ten and fifty k. Someone will be providing rides. To me, the real the real challenge is orbital, and there are a couple different challenges there. One is to get the cost low enough as a barrier of entry that people can do speculative experiments. People can launch 50 CubeSat cameras to take real-time traffic pictures. I don't know, you know. I don't even know what they want to do, but I just know that right now that having to spend a minimum of, say, $20 million to launch anything on your schedule, on your time, m means that in order to throw, burn $20 million, that's a pretty serious, pretty serious barrier. So clearly, being able to actually launch useful things at a lower cost is, is a huge is a huge uh, task to overcome. And so that's, in the long term, that would be my goal, uh, is to build you know, a nanosat launcher and then bootstrap that into a larger business, building you know, Falcon 1 size and then you know, keep moving up.